scrolling through and give you an idea of some of the things that we saw uh, on that field trip. I think I will. Okay, well, the desert is, that's the Chihuahua Desert where we were uh, and where the poppies are blooming and it's uh, really a pretty hard scrabble desert except when it gets a little bit of uh, rain and it had been a moist enough uh, winter last year that uh, the poppies were uh, starting to bloom. Uh, they're early bloomers, they're annuals, so they bloom from seed every year and it has to be enough moisture in the soil for the poppies to um, germinate and to bloom. Um, so we uh, drove out through the, from Rockhound State Park area uh, down a dirt road that parallels the east side of the mountains. Uh, and when we saw a um, good patch of poppies we, or flowers, we would get out and, and look around. And some places they were so uh, thick that we really had to kind of tiptoe through them. But there was a lot more there than just the poppies. Uh, uh, and we were like, it was like we were looking for little treasures and uh, diamonds in the rough as we were uh, stepping through the poppies. Not everybody tiptoed through the poppies though. Uh, there was an area uh, all through there where there was evidence of grazing and actually in this area right here was one of the uh, premier poppy blooming displays. And I think a lot of that was because the cows had eaten away and overgrazed a lot of the grass that, so the uh, poppies didn't have any competition for what soil moisture there was. There were a lot of uh, smaller flowers that we could uh, stumble upon literally as we were looking through the poppies. And most of these were in the little drainage areas that were coming off the mountains, just little washes and just uh, uh, small areas where there was a little bit of extra impulse of water. And in those, we uh, found a lot of the, the little patches and individual flowers. This is a desert thimbleweed, an enemy tuberosa. Uh, and it, I was pretty excited to find that. It's such a delicate little flower. And then to find it blooming in the desert, it looks totally out of place. So that was uh, one of the things that I had particularly been looking for uh, to, to, because uh, it's an anemone. It's in the same family as pasky flowers and some of the others that uh, we've seen, but I've never seen this one before. Another flower that uh, is small and insignificant uh, unless you stumble on se several of them is the long-bracked deerweed, <coughs> uh, a crimson oroboides. And uh, it's always amazes when me and, and one of the reasons I like to take pictures is because you can get down and really start seeing some of the things that normally you would uh, not, you would pass over if you were not uh, paying a lot of attention. Uh, the large petaled onion, Allium macropetalum, was um, quite, a, we saw some nice examples of it. And you can see how they uh, have such a nice uh, cluster of flowers coming up from the little bulbs that are down in the ground. And macropetalatum means large petals. And you can see how showy they are. Another flower that we would see here and there scattered uh, among the gravelly, sandy soil is the ashen milk bitch, Astragalus tephroides. tephroides. I don't, I'm not real good at my Latin, but um, I'll try. Um, so that was nice to start seeing some of these things that attracted a lot of the butterflies and bees. However, I think it was cool enough. Uh, we didn't see many pollinators. I was surprised at the, the lack of pollinators that we saw. James Crepantha, Crepantha cinera, is, <clears throat> I think it's the largest uh, Crepantha in the state. And it was about six inches or so tall with this nice little round cluster of, of flowers on it. 
and we uh, these again were just kind of scattered along the rocky uh, arroyos and places where we would get out and stroll around and look. We made several stops. Uh, we would stop and, and walk up and down an arroyo and, and see uh, what we could find and uh, then drive a little farther in the car uh, and check out the next spot. Uh, the flower on the left is bearded prairie clover, Dahlia pogonatera, thera, and the one on the right is the slender trumpet gia, Icomopsis longiflora, long flower. Another drainage that we found um, had a whole lot of spectacle pie. This isn't uh, an unusual plant. It's probably one of the most common early bloomers in the state. I mean, it was a, areas where there were some nice big clusters of it like this. It's easier to appreciate some of these little flowers that are weeds in the yard when you see a nice big display of them like this. There were two of these little members of the geranium family, uh, Fillery, which on the left, Erodium, Erodium circuitarum, which is a uh, introduced naturalized uh, flower. These are only about the size of a, a dime or, or so, maybe not that large. Um, so we saw those, but then the, the Texas heronbill or cranesbill uh, has a flower that's about the size of a quarter or a little larger, uh, Erodium circuitarium. Uh, so it's fun to see these little flowers uh, scattered around also. There's a lot of different kinds of lepidiums, uh, pepper weeds. This is the Thurber's pepper weed, which is the uh, Lepidium thurberi, thurberi and uh, it's uh, quite larger than the Virginiana, which is one that's very common. Uh, it has a lot larger flowers and it's a larger plant. I mean, it was fun to see this ne Nevada biscuit root, Loma Lomadium nevadensi. Um, we have some of uh, different ones, a yellow uh, blooming one that blooms in the petroglyphs and in the desert area in Bernalillo County. So this was one that's uh, very closely related, uh, but has the big clusters of white flowers. So it's real interesting. I haven't done much botanizing that far south in the state to see uh, a shift in some of the species, the same genus, but the different species. To see that con continuum, it was interesting. George, could you give us the family that these species are in as you go along? Okay, sure. The, um, if I can remember them, I will. Well, this is a legume. Fabiaceae, the short stem lupin, um, lupin brevi collis, brevi is short and collis is stem. And you can see the pinnate leaves with, um, and it's uh, the stem of the flower is not very long at all as, you, as is appropriately named. And these were scattered around. I've never seen these thick at all like some lupin species uh, that bloom uh, in mass, these are just uh, very scattered around. Early, early blooming cactus. Uh, I've made several trips to Las Cruces in the Oregons to try to find this blooming because it blooms as, as you might guess in February and March. Uh, and we found one of these in bloom. Uh, and what's fun about them is this red uh, st stigma here. So um, uh, that's a nice contrast in the flower. And these are small, um, a small hedgehog cactus. And uh, so you have to go south to find these early in the year. The, uh, we have a uh, Cilandro Punta imbricata here and in, in the South, it's spinosaur, spinosaur, and 
excuse me again for the pronunciations, uh, walking stick show you, um, but these are scattered around in the uh, desert too. Uh, I pulled a, a photo of, of a flower off the off Sinet, uh, and uh, because it was way too early for them to be blooming. And a nipple cactus. So this is part of the, you know, the, the treasures you find stumbling around looking uh, in the, between the rocks and in the, uh, for, for what you might find blooming, but the nipple cactus, Mammillaria hydrii, um, has flowers that circle, and little white flowers or cream colored flowers that circle the whole stem and then I've seen them with uh, a whole circle of these red fruit that stay on over the winter. And as you can see, this is just a flat little pancake uh, cactus that's uh, down at rock level. Yellow desert primrose, Anethera primaveris, um, in the evening primrose family. Um, I saw, I think I only saw one or two of these as we were hiking around. So um, uh, there's, as any uh, area that's arid like this, uh, besides a few mass blooming species, there'll be a lot of, of species that are scattered around where we only see one or two of them maybe if we're sharp. Fiddler's Pinstemon. It's, it's always fun to see it's uh, blooming right out of the rocky soils, um, the Pistamon fendlerii, uh, and uh, called beard tongue. And you can see the the line, the guidelines here for bumblebees, and the bumblebees can crawl in and uh, they get pollen dusted on their back, the, back in the base of the flower or the nectar glands. Uh, and so they'll, uh, with their tongues, reach back and, and get the nectar. And then uh, as they come out, the, the uh, pistil is back in here too. So they'll get, the, get it pollinated that way. Uh, we saw uh, not a lot, but we saw these uh, along with one stop, there were uh, growing off, off and on all along the little arroyo where we stopped. Two phacelias here are scorpion plants. The Arizona phacelia on the left, phacelia arizonica, and the manga spring phacelia on the right, phacelia bombacina. Uh, you can see the, the scorpion shaped or the curled shape of the flower stem with the flowers on, on one side of it. That's where it gets its name, like a scorpion's tail. But look how different the two flowers are. Uh, I'd never seen this one, never seen, hadn't seen either of these, but they were uh, blooming uh, quite commonly in some of the areas where we uh, explored. Desert chicory, this looks like the right tax stem that we have in our area and a little farther south, but uh, this is a little different. Uh, it doesn't have the uh, tax uh, hair like. Uh, glandular ta uh, hairs on the on the stems, uh, but it looks the flower looks very much like it. Uh, these were again were uh, kind of isolated populations of them that where we would find, but they are uh, easy to spot because they have nice showy flowers. For some reason, well, I know why. This is a, a fate was a favorite of mine to find. Um, it's a sleepy catch fly, a Selene anterrania, and it's, uh, you can see why it's called a catch fly. The, you can see the, the wasp up here that's on the stem has these red bands, sticky rosinous bands that uh, maybe they keep ants and uh, other animals from climbing up to stare, steal the pollen, but uh, and they have these tiny flowers. These are only about a fourth of an inch wide. And uh, the pollen, the nectar glands down in the base here. So it takes a uh, uh, bee with a, 
a moderate to long tongue to be able to pollinate it. Uh, but this is very common by, if you look at the map, it's in almost every county in the state, uh, but it's just kind of a little weedy plant that you don't hardly ever see. I don't hardly ever see uh, until I really start looking for them. Uh, it's in the same family as um, uh, some of them a lot more showier catch flies. This is really one of my favorite flowers, the Lear Leaf Jewel Flower, Streptanthus carinatus. Uh, this is the one we saw, um, you can see the poppies in the background here. We saw this right in the middle of a wash. There were three or four of these blooming uh, with a pearly white, beautiful uh, shaped odd flowers. Uh, we didn't see this one. Uh, this is uh, from the Cabradus, which is, uh, just outside, outside of a Bosque del Apache and Socorro, a nice trip that we like to do in the spring too. But I've seen the, this also comes in a, a bright yellow and then they'll interbreed and you get all kinds of uh, tones and hues mixed in between it. Uh, so this is in the mustard family. Uh, again, it's like I said, it's th this odd shape uh, and beautiful colors is, makes it one of my favorites. The Western wallflower, Arisium capitatum. Um, so quite a few of those along the, and uh, they're in, I see these a lot in the sandias. I happened to be up there this spring, this summer, and they were uh, the yellow swallowtails, two-tailed swallowtails were just all over them. Uh, feeding on them. It's called a wallflower uh, because it's named after a uh, flower in Europe that grows by walls. And so they, you know, whoever came up with a common name called it a wallflower. It's in the mustard family. It also comes in an orange uh, coloration too. So uh, and the sandias, I've seen the yellow and the orange one both growing on the Tecalote Trail. This was a new flower for me, the greens bird, greens birds foot trefoil, say that three times in a row. Um, Acmispen greenii, I think it used to be a lotus. It's a little member of the legume family and this was the first uh, flower I saw that was in full bloom and covering vast acreage, acreages of ground. Um, so here it is. Uh, it's not quite as showy as the poppy, but uh, it has um, probably as many flowers here as the poppies do. So if you're a pollinator, it's, it's, it's a good show here. Uh, but I thought this would make a nice uh, ground cover for uh, landscaping. I don't know, I would imagine, I don't know how cold sensitive it is or, or how long it stays green, but uh, it does definitely uh, cover some wide areas uh, on the slopes. So here's the another mass bloomer, Garden's Bladder Pod, Fasaria Gordoni, uh, an annual and uh, the annuals seem to be the ones that do the mass blooming. And they'll sometimes wait for years before the, the seeds germinate. Some years, the garden's bladder pod is the only thing that blooms. And sometimes the poppies are the only thing that blooms. Last year there was, or this year really, uh, there was a mixture in some areas. You can see the poppies, the golden poppies here in the yellow of the bladder pods. Yeah, it's a, it's, they're a mustard, the bladder pods are. Excuse me, George. Yeah. Um, what kind of poppies? Somebody had asked, uh, is it a Mexican poppy or what? Yes, it's the Mexican, it's the California poppy variety Mexicana. So it's um, the Mexican, we'll get to that um, when I get to the poppy slides. And we'll talk about that. So you can see how the, um, the land is surface is just filled in here with uh, every possible spot in the slope 
has flowers on it. These bushes, I think, are mesquite that just haven't leafed out yet. Mesquite are some of the last things to leaf out in the desert. And the creosote bush here and the uh, uh, Lazenliides barrel cactus. So this was really a rich little area right here. Must have gotten a little extra runoff, maybe an extra uh, thunderstorm in the winter. So now we can talk about poppies. Uh, the Mexican poppy, um, Escola, <laughs> watch my tongue get twisted. Somebody want to say that? Escolosia, uh, Californica subspecies Mexicana. And I think it Hattie said Eschultzia, George. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there's two spellings of this. I don't know if you can see the, the name on your screen or not. Um, the, this is the way it's spelled here, E-S-C-H-S-C-H-O-L-Z-I-A, is the way it's in most of the literature. And the latest, so sometimes you'll see it L. T Z I A and Kelly Audrey in the latest Flora New Mexicana explains that the it was named after a person who's had the T in his name and it was misspelled. And so ever since then it, it's been misspelled, and that's the accepted uh, spelling of it now by most authorities. However, there is precedence for going back and correcting a misspelling in a scientific name and changing it. And so Kelly uh, says that uh, he's going to, he's doing that in his, uh, his floor of New Mexicana. And uh, he, <laughs> he says he apparently is the only one doing it, has recognized that the, the stand, the name needs to be corrected. So um, I'll still use the, the, uh, old spelling without the T in it. Um, but the uh, slopes uh, from the mountains, you can see the creosote basin down here that doesn't have much growing in it, uh, but then you see the slopes on the sides up here, and then the slopes here. So, you, so it doesn't take much change in elevation to uh, get, uh, get the poppy blooms. Uh, maybe it's just the water runoff soaks in by the time it gets down before it gets down into the basin here. This is an area that was heavily grazed with, uh, and the poppies were very prolific along here, along with some of the prickly pears. Um, this is one of the stops where we got out and uh, spent some time wandering around taking pictures. So these people that live up in this house here have a pretty nice front yard native plant landscaping. You can kind of see here how this is just a little bit lower. There's a little bit of uh, depression here. We got a little extra water. So the poppies are particularly thick here and also the uh, Choya cactus is growing here. So it's uh, just doesn't take much of a depression or a slope to really affect the water runoff and what blooms there. So the uh, rugged cactus and the nice soft texture of the poppies is really something that's amazing. One of our stops we explored around this hill and uh, there was a lot of grow growing there. Uh, poppies you can see some of them are still uh, closed. They open up starting around midday when it starts getting warm. So we'd go out first and first thing in the morning and there wouldn't be, you wouldn't really notice many poppies because they all, they would, all the buds would be closed up. You can see one right here that hasn't opened up yet, probably tomorrow, the next day it would open. Uh, so really it's the, to find the best time to see the poppies is in the afternoons. There's enough variety here 
the, you have the white poppies occasionally uh, show up, uh, then the yellow, po yeah, golden poppies with the dark center, and then ones that are just solid dark. So uh, there's enough variation here that uh, uh, there's a lot of the garden poppies uh, have taken those variations and um, isolated them and, and, and uh, selected for darker colors or vibrant colors for the seeds that you buy in the stores. So uh, again, in, in 2021, um, this, I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, make another trip this next spring. It's the sort of thing we can social distance in, drive our own cars. Um, I don't know if Rockhound State Park will be open for camping. Um, there's plenty of motels in Deming that probably hopefully would, would have uh, some capacity where we could stay. So um, I'm looking forward and I hope we can do this again, uh, will as the new year progresses, the January and February, we'll be making announcements about our field trips. And I think we're gonna try some uh, social distancing field trips uh, where we can go in our own cars and uh, either, you know, keep our social distance as we look at the flowers or um, have a, a web page that, or a Facebook page that tells where people are going and what's there, so other so we can um, follow along if we want to. So that's it. Um, this is my new book. This is a mock-up of the cover of my new book that's coming out in March. Uh, it won't have those exact pictures on it, but that's the the way. Uh, generally what it looked like. So I'm looking forward to being able to uh, see that when it gets done. Okay, so that I'm gonna stop share right now so we can go back to the to our main screen. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them or I don't know if we're gonna do just chat questions or, or what. So, um, uh, So now I think Pam is going to present. Uh, she went in September, and the, there's a whole course after the monsoons in the summer, if there are some. Um, there's a whole new set of flowers that bloom in the fall, and so Pam's going to talk about that. Hey, I'll I'll share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? You're good. Okay. So, um, the Floridas are in the uh, Luna County and they're near Deming. This is the Floridas right here. Here is a close up of uh, Mahoney Park, where we went, which is on the west side of the Floridas. Um, and we went September 23rd through around the 26th or 27th. So we went because uh, and I don't want to get too deeply into this, but uh, there is a mining company that was permitted by the BLM to essentially blow away these two hills. Um, they were permitted for a dolomite mine. And uh, I went there with some members of the uh, Great Old Broads for the Wilderness. And Philip came with me to look at the area and talk with the uh, lawyer who is part of uh, the litigation against this mine going in. 
So, and also to, I was hoping to find plants that were endangered or, um, you know, endangered plants or rare plants. I, I really didn't find any. I did, however, find an archeological site that they didn't find or didn't report. So at any rate, my um, pictures are organized by family, Kent, you might in appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and um, this is a little woody, uh, I would call it a sub shrub, um, Carlo, Carlo Ridea linearia folia, um, and it doesn't have a common name other than Carlo Ridea. And uh, um, here is a, why isn't this working? Here's a close up of the flower. It's very um, small. And this uh, petal is uh, reflexed. So it, um, acts as a landing platform for the pollinator. And here's uh, the fruit of that one. And, um, and next, and so this is an order of family. And these were on the south side of one of those hills, very arid, of course. And this is in the amaranth family, Freilichia gracilis, a slender snake cotton. And I, this isn't a very good picture, but it was very difficult to get a good picture of this plant because it is so tall and skinny. But I wanted to show you the whorl of leaves here. And then there's some basil leaves at the bottom. Obviously, that's why they're called basil. <laughs> and um, here you can see the flower close up. It's very cottony. It has all these little hairs. And so it's very interesting. And I didn't remember having seen it before, but Lenore told me that we had seen it, I think she said at the Quebradas um, before. So, and this, uh, was not in bloom, but I thought that the uh, plant itself was very interesting to show you. It's a vine, it's um, Dutchman's pipe, and it was growing out of the side of an arroyo bank, um, and the leaves turn red in the fall, and it's the um, larval plant for this beautiful butterfly, the uh, pipe vine swallowtail. And I was hoping that this might be a rare plant, but apparently it isn't. Just because I haven't seen it before, it doesn't mean that it's particularly rare. And this is off of SciNet, a photo by this person, Eugene Sterla, and that's what the flower looks like, but it blooms in the spring, I believe. So we didn't get a chance to see the flower. And then in the Asteraceae, of course, there were very, a uh, great deal of representatives from the Asteraceae. Um, and this is burrow weed, sorry. And, um, you know, the, Oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. So here's a close up of the panatophid leaves that are scruffy. So when you touch them, they, they feel rough. And again, oh, and I wanted to say this is very much like, it looks like um, rabbit bush brush rather, rabbit brush or chamisa, but it's not, it's this plant. So it's a sub shrub also. 
And then this is uh, Lacey Sleepy Daisy, also in the Aster family. Um, and it has little prickles, thus it's named spinulosum on the leaves and pretty much just on the leaves. And this is one of the more beautiful plants, as George mentioned in our practice session, it's used a lot as a landscape plant, especially in Texas. Um, and uh, so it's Tacoma stands in the um, begonia family, um, yellow trumpet bush. And here is, I don't know if it's the primary um, pollinator, but it's a xylocopa bee identified by Tom. Um, and uh, it has this particular bee has this really greenish shine to its body. And keep it in mind, you will be seeing it in more unfortunate circumstances later on. And um, here's a close up of it. And there's a view to the uh, south, I think. Um, and so you can see it's growing in amongst this um, uh, why can't I remember what those are called? Ocotillas. Yeah, Ocotillo field. And I mean, there's just a field of these Ocotillas and they were leafed out, um, I guess, because they must have gotten some rain or something because usually Ocotillos only leaf out in the spring as far as I know. So, and um, here's the same barrel cactus that George had noted with the Western Florida mountains in the background. And there were still some in bloom. So this was the beautiful blooms that I got to take a photo of. Oh, and George and Tom, you guys identified this Apuntia, and I had asked Tom to send me the species, but I, I don't know if he ever got around to it. Do you remember? No. Sorry, I no, I never got around to it, but I think it's Chloranthus. Oh, okay. Chloranthus. Yeah, and the fruits on these are like two or three inches long. They're just enormous. And um, I kind of wanted to gather some, but I did not bring any tongs with me. And I kind of figured, unlike the hose, I probably wouldn't really do much with them. So I didn't want to collect them unless I was going to use them. And this was very exciting for me to see. Um, Apodanthera undulata, this is called Melon Loco. And it's, uh, we found it, we kept finding it at these, we kept finding these seed coats of seeds that were carbonized from archeological sites in Southern New Mexico. And we figured they were in the cucurbitaceae family because the cucurbit seeds in cross section, they have this distinct palisade cell zones. Um, so there are these cells like stacked up on top of each other. And it's typical of the cucurbit genera as I'm saying in this uh, text here. Um, so um, my colleague, Lisa Huckle, finally figured out that uh, these seed coats were representative of this, uh, of this particular species in the cucurbit family. And the first time I saw it was in Chihuahua, in northern Chihuahua, Mexico. And 
I got some samples and was very excited to see it, but I've never seen it in bloom and here it is in bloom. Um, so in Mexico, the mashed pulp of one species, it's a different species than this. It's used to treat urinary ailments. And in Zacatecas, Mexico, vendors sell roasted seeds by the bag, like we sell pinon nuts by the bag. And so archaeologically in Mexico, it's eight have been found in caves of the Tehuacan Valley and Huila Naquit in Oaxaca, which is also the site of the earliest documented maize and squash. Um, the maize is like a, a variant of Teosinte, which is where maize was domesticated from. Teosinte is a wild grass that grows in Mexico. And this variety, this, um, variety found in the cave is like between what we know as corn, as maize, and teosinte. So that was fun. Did you ask me something, George? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. So this we found along the road. Um, we were leaving and I'm screaming to Philip, stop the car, stop the car. And um, it, this is just such a beautiful plant. Um, I knew it was in the Euphorbiaceae because of the fruit um, having, you know, they, they all pretty much look like this. And then the leaves remind me of uh, poinsettia, which is also in the euphorbia family. They're all very poisonous. Um, and this is called big root jatropha. Um, I couldn't find any uses for it. Um, other euphorbias have been used medicinally, but this particular one doesn't seem to have any documented uses. And then moving on to the uh, bean family, Fabaceae. This is a little white ball acacia. It's a short little shrub about um, three to four feet high. Um, and it has these beautiful very typical acacia flowers. And this is also in the Fabaceae. It's a senna, um, Lindheimer senna, with beautiful flowers. And this was in the side of an arroyo. As George is saying, well, some of his plants were, were out in the open, but Many of the ones I'm showing you were in arroyos or growing on the edges of arroyos. Um, and this one was in the same area as the, the plant that in the amaranth family, um, like on the side of behind that hill, one of those hills that I showed you. So this is stinging Savalia in the same family as stick leaf. And you can kind of see um, the leaf is very similar to stick leaf, but this one has stinging hairs along the margins. And so you really don't want to touch it. It's very unpleasant. <laughs> And then um, these were all along the hillside up above, um, right near where the um, Tacoma stands was, the yellow trumpet flower, um, hibiscus denudatus or desert rose mallow. So this, it, it's, it's slightly woody, but um, 
So it's, but it's not exactly a sub shrub. And here's a Phillips picture of the close up of that flower. Really beautiful because they're very large for a wildflower. And, um, and then the devil's claw was in bloom. Um, so the seeds and the young fruits were eaten. They, they supposedly taste like okra. Um, and then the mature fruit is used for basketry fiber. Um, I've seen a lot of baskets made with uh, devil's claw in uh, on the Tahona Oadam uh, reservation. They, they use that material a lot in their basketry. And this one, I actually, I don't know why I didn't think it was a pen stem. <laughs> so I asked Bob Savinsky what it was and he said, it's pen stem and thurberide. So um, this is what they look like as the whole plant and there's a close up. They're really beautiful pen stems. I wish we could grow them as a landscape plant. And this plant, when I came upon it, there were just a few of them. And I thought it was a lupin. And I posted it on the um, the listserv and asked some people to help me with the identification. And um, Dana Price said she was often fooled by this plant and thought it was in the Fabaceae, but it's actually in the Melkwort family. So I think this is blue Melkwort uh, from looking on SignNet, but I'm not positive. And there is a close up of the flowers. It's really a beautiful plant, very, um, I don't know how to describe it. It just is very surprising to come upon. And this is a, a photograph of what the bee bush, which is all a shrub um, that is growing all over uh, this area in the Verbena family. Um, Alois, Aloysia ridei. Um, and I got this photograph off the web. So don't tell anyone because I was supposed to get permission. <laughs> and there's a close up of it. And it was used to treat headaches, distemper, rheumatism, and gonorrhea. So it has quite a number of. <laughs> medicinal uses. And this is according to Michael Moore's book. And this is a picture of Philip standing next to, for perspective, this agave palmeri. And apparently the other uh, person, one of the people who was down there uh, went for a more extensive walk in the area just to the uh, west of where we were. And he said there were fields of agave palmeri. And it's critical for pollinators, bats, hummingbirds, insects, but especially for the migratory bat, Leptonicturus. So I think that this area is, if it's not important for all this flora and the one archeological site I found, um, it's certainly important for this population of agave and its pollinators. And here we have life and death in the desert. <laughs> I happened to see this. Um, praying mantis, which is on what I think is an Abert's buckwheat, devouring 
one of the bees that you know I had taken the photograph of it on the yellow trumpet flower and the poor bee was still alive it was but that's life in the in nature so that's that's um all I have thank you